Okay. I just want to start by saying why I hate those. Um, if, if, if they'll get better videos, I can't stand them. Because they're aimed at us. They're aimed at queer people to tell us, just grin and bear it. Just hang in there. Where are the videos aimed at straight people to tell them to act differently? That's what I'm looking for. So my talk is about familial homophobia. Despite the emphasis on gay marriage and parenthood that has overwhelmed our freedom vision, and I believe that it has overwhelmed it, how gays and lesbians are treated in families is far more influential on the quality of our lives than how we are treated as families. Tonight I'm going to try to articulate how and why systems of familial homophobia operate, and most importantly, how they can be changed. Because it's really important to understand what's wrong, but it's really important to have a vision of how to move forward and transform it. Those are the two sides of the coin. So let me start by imagining a way that a family could respond to someone, one of their members coming out. It could go like this. They discuss with the family their special responsibility to protect her from pressures and cruelties that they themselves will never face. They promise not to exploit or enjoy privileges that she is denied and to commit their family's resources to accessing those privileges for her and other queer people who they treat like real human beings. And they insist that their gay family member treat other queer people with accountability as well. In their larger family, in their friendships, in their workplaces, in their consumption or production of culture, in how they vote and what laws they support and access, they intervene when queer people are being scapegoated by directly addressing the perpetrator. This is not impossible. This is totally reasonable and totally possible. Yet, Today, families are much more likely to tolerate us, that is, keep us in a position of lesser value, than to learn from us and be elevated by our knowledge. Because of this twisted paradox, gay people are being punished within the family, even though we have not done anything wrong. This punishment has dramatic consequences on both our experiences and also on our most trusting, loving relationships. Now strangely, I'm talking to you in a moment where most people will tell you that things are getting better. The AIDS crisis forced Americans to start the process of acknowledging that gay people exist. Before AIDS, they would pretend we didn't exist. With AIDS, they had to acknowledge that we do exist. Thus, even though there are many institutions today that still pretend we do not exist, there are other institutions that acknowledge in some form that we do exist. It's a bizarre set of daily contradictions that we have to balance and internalize. Sometimes you turn on the TV and every character who's gay. Sometimes you turn on the TV and it's like there's no gay people in the world. You never know what you're going to find around any corner. However, when the acknowledgement does occur, it's often very problematic. Does the fact that openly gay people are allowed some rights in some circumstances mean that things are getting better? Or does the fact that so much profound exclusion and distortion pervades, does that have more negative meaning than it did 60 years ago when there was no visible movement? I think it's obvious that deliberately excluding people when you know they exist is a more destructive and sadistic action now than it was in the past when so few of us were known. <coughs> Knowing queer people, everyone in America knows someone who's queer now, even if it's only on TV, right? We have visibility to a certain extent. So knowing queer people and seeing our wish for justice and still denying us basic rights, denying us integration into the public conversation of the culture and excluding us from authentic mainstream re representation is a condition of oppression that should no longer exist. Considering how much work we have done and how enormous our efforts to create social transformation have been, we are not where we should be. Change is 
Change is not the same thing as progress. Don't confuse them. Yes, the ways we are contained are different. The ways we are situated as lesser than are far more sophisticated than they were when I was 8, 16, or 25. But compared to where we should be right now, we're nowhere. We have been bombarded with so many false messages about how much better off we are that we've gotten confused about what we really deserve and what both liberation and equality would actually look like and how truly possible they are. Being niche marketed a product is not citizenship. It is the end of autonomy, not the beginning. Now it's true there will, there will always be some people for whom monogamous coupling for life is the best option. And gay people on that path should have full equality. Of course many gay people do not equate monogamy and marriage, and just you wait until straight people figure that one out. But whatever marriage means to anyone should be fully legally protected, obviously. But there is an ideology emerging from the official gay leadership positioning the pretense of monogamous life coupling as the best and superior and only and desi most desirable way to be gay. Even though straight people vociferously refuse to vote us right, even with these dire requirements, they're often happy to let us become our only visible public image. And because we now believe what corporate America tells us about ourselves, there are some queer people who now negotiate acceptance by their families by getting married and having children. As a feminist, I have to say I am appalled by any ideology that tells women to get married, gay or straight. This marketing of gay marriage has gotten us, us off track of thinking critically about the truth of our own condition and how to create radical social change. Very little is known about how our oppression is constructed and what its consequences are on us emotionally. Our reconceptualization of our own destiny has only just begun. Now, the most progressive impulses in American life, which I think are black power, feminism, and gay liberation, were rooted in agendas that came from real people's true lived experiences, in contrast to the lie of who they were being told they were. But we, LGBT people in the year 2010, are listening to everyone but ourselves. We listen to corporate culture, corporate media, Hollywood, our president, our insipid national organizations, Showtime, and Ellen. We have let all this capitalist noise obscure what we are really experiencing. When I look at what I am really experiencing today in American theater and U.S. publishing, things are worse for authentic work of lesbian protagonists than they have ever been in my lifetime. How can it be that things are getting better if there's not a single lesbian play in the American repertoire? In 1992, there were five or six lesbian novels published by mainstream presses every year. Now it's one every two or three years. When we need them the most, we are dismantling our most effective apparatus, which I think is constructed of our subculture, which is a treasure, which produces authentic representation of our true experiences, right? The culture of opposition, in which we refuse to be lied to about, and most importantly, the community relationship. That's why we are all sitting in this room together, because we are in a community together, not because we were sold products. Right? This community relationship has historically been our richest and most humanizing creation. If we had lived in privatized family units in 1984, in a way that we are told to do in 2010, we never would have been able to respond so effectively to the AIDS crisis. Never. Could we rise to that occasion so magnificently today? If you look at our recent track record, now that things are so much better, today we are unable to win anything. We've just lost 31 out of 31 ballot measures for this country. Okay, we have not had a significant victory since the Supreme Court decision in 2003 that overturned the sodomy law. Now this twist, calling a constant state of injustice progress gets played out in a number of distorting ways. We pretend that we are accepted when we are not. For example, having a gay character in a book, play, film, or television show falsely codes that word as progressive. Often it even results in the work winning an award from the lab. 
if the actual meaning and content of the specific representation is examined, many of these images are retrograde. They often portray the gay person as alone, lesser than, a sidekick in the Tonto role, or there to provide an emotional catharsis to make the straight protagonist or viewer a better person. What current cultural representation rarely presents are complex human beings with authority and sexuality who are affected by homophobia in addition to their other human experiences. Human beings who are protagonists. That type of death and primacy would for force audiences to universalize to gay people, which is part of the equality process. It would also force an acknowledgement of heterosexual cruelty as a constant and daily part of American life. And that's what we're seeing when we're looking at this, this rash of gay suicide. These oppressive conventions and structures are kept in place by some concrete strategies. One crucial strategy is the use of false accusations to maintain gay people's subordinate status. False accusations are inaccurate and misleading statements about queer people and about homosexuality that force us to live with the burden of a stigma that we don't deserve and to then pay the emotional and social price of having to prove innocence that we should, that should not have to be proven. I mean, I think there's little that is more demeaning than being forced to prove something that is obvious. The most typically vulgar false accusation that homosexuals face is that homosexuality is somehow wrong and or inferior to heterosexuality. This is a typical smokescreen kind of argument, an argument so ridiculous and in fact